We left off our last study towards the end of Job chapter 1. Actually, Job chapter 1 verse 19 was the last verse that we really looked at together. Uh, And we sort of surveyed this opening portion of the book of Job in chapter 1, where you, you sort of have this stage that is set for the drama that will unfold throughout the 42 chapters of the book of Job, a stage on earth which showed us Job and his family and his blessings and his material possessions and all the great things he had and all the the good life that he lived because he was a blameless and an upright man. He he, he was a man who was righteous. And then we're shown not only the earthly stage, but we're also shown the, the heavenly stage, seeing behind the curtain, as it were, you know, that curtain that, that invisible curtain that sort of divides heaven from earth and makes us unable to see what goes on in the heavenlies, that's parted for us. It's open for us here in Job chapter 1. And we see this, um, this debate, this competition, this argument between God and Satan himself uh, where they go back and forth about who Job is and why he serves God. And basically a, a bet, a wager is laid. I don't know if it's proper to say that. It's not exactly the right term, but you understand what I mean. A competition of sorts is laid out where, where God says, no, my, my servant Job will love me and serve me and he will not curse me no matter if all the blessings in his life are taken away. And Satan says, no, 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 I'm very confident that if you allow me, God, to take away his blessings, this man Job will curse you to his face. And we saw it in very vivid fashion last week. This was in verses 13 through 19. How all these blessings were taken away from Job in one day. Do you remember how that happened? It happened in a way that was meant to maximize the impact upon Job. Where, you, you know, the, the, the Chaldeans came as bandits and they, they slaughtered a bunch of Job's servants and they stole his livestock. And then the Sabaeans came from another place and did the same kind of thing. And, and then some sort of fire fell from heaven. That's what they called it. They called it fire from heaven. Came and burnt up another large portion of Job's livestock. But in the cruelest, cruelest point of all, his Dear children, ten children, all grown up, all adults, all getting along together marvelously. There they were gathered together for probably some kind of birthday celebration over at the oldest brother's home. And a great wind came and flattened the house, and all Job's ten adult children died in one day. Or after this devastating loss of losing all of these things that were great and tremendous blessings in his life, you can just imagine what it's like behind that heavenly curtain, right? You can just imagine what it is like where where all of heaven, so to speak, is bending down and cupping its ear. You know, what's Job going to do? Here he's been put on the spot, right? The test has been applied. You ever seen those sort of things where they're testing different materials? You know, they're they're bending an iron bar to see how much it'll bend before it breaks. They're they're putting weight on a bridge to see how much it it will bear before it breaks. And there's a lot of tension in those testing scenes, aren't there? And because there's the engineer and there's the manufacturer and they're going, but will it hold the strain? Will it last? Will it be destroyed? You know, and weight after weight is piled upon and they're just waiting to see what will happen, what the test results will come out. You you can have this just in your automobile. You know, every year or every couple years you have to get your car tested, right? I remember many times in California you have to get your, your... Every two years, you have to get what's called the smog test, you know, to to test the vehicle emissions that come forth from your car. Customary thing, you know, they go into the mechanics and they put the thing forth. And, you know, as as a young man, and perhaps even as an older man, I was never really been able to afford great cars. And so usually it was a very iffy proposition whether or not my cars would pass the smog test. And I remember, you know, you go to the mechanic and you get it there and you just sort of walk back and forth waiting, oh Lord, please, I hope it passes, I hope it passes, you know. And then they print out the report and you find out whether it passed or failed. Well, one might say that all of heaven was bending over, waiting to see what Job's response would be to see if he would pass or fail in the midst of this great calamity that had come upon him. And that brings us to verse 20, right? Because here's Job's response. Verses 20 through 22. Look at it carefully with me. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head. And he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, 
Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Quite a response for a man who just lost everything, right? He he was an incredibly wealthy man, and on one day, in that day, when a man's wealth was measured by how much livestock he had and how many servants he had, he lost all of his livestock and all of his servants, as if he had a big, fat stock portfolio worth millions upon millions of dollars or euros. And then in one day, it doesn't just decline by 50%, which would be a big blow, right, to any person who's big in the financial markets. No, it was completely liquidated. It was gone. His net worth was zero. In this wonderful, blessed family. You know, Job could have thought, you know, I can always earn more money. What do I do about my children that have died? You can just imagine the heaviness of grief that would come upon the man at that time. And so here he's going to react. And as I said before, it's as if all of heaven, every faithful angel and every fallen angel, God himself and and, and the devil himself, they're all sort of on the edge of their seat. They're they're, they're bending over. What's Job going to do? And look very carefully here at verse 20 and see the record of what it did. It says, then Job arose and he tore his robe. If I could get a little fanciful here. If I could just sort of say what what might have been going on in heaven at that moment. You can just imagine Satan. He sees Job tear his robe and Satan goes, you know, this could be good. This could be good. Tearing the robe. That's an act of mourning, right? Mourning. That's good. I want Job to mourn. I want him to be so desperate with sorrow and sickness that he curses God. So Satan's so far encouraged by the first few words that we find there in verse 20. And then what does it say next? He shaved his head. And Satan in heaven, he's going, yes, this is good. I like this. I can see it. Shaving his head. That's another act of mourning, right? Uh, life is not normal. I can't carry on as if things are normal. I'm shaving my head in an act of mourning. Then it says, he fell to the ground. And Satan's saying, you know, this is starting to get good. He's completely layway. He he can't do anything. He's just collapsing on the ground. And Satan's waiting on the edge of his seat, as it were, to hear those words of cursing, which Job would surely pronounce against the Lord in just a moment. Now, what's the next thing tell us there in verse 20? What did Job do? He worshipped. Isn't that amazing? He worshipped God. Now, there's two things that I want to focus on here for just a moment. First of all, the fact that Job mourned. Listen, that is significant. Don't ever miss that. Job used the traditional customs and gestures of mourning in his day. If somebody had experienced great loss, if they had lost a loved one, such as the 10 children that Job lost in that one afternoon, it would be very common for them to use these expressions of mourning, tearing the clothes, shaving the head, falling to the ground. These were traditional expressions of mourning. Job mourned. He didn't pretend like nothing happened. It is possible for Christians to promote what you might call a false faith, a a pseudo-faith, a a faith that puts itself out there and says, what faith is, is pretending that things aren't real. Oh, Job, don't, you know, cheer up, Job. You know, Job, behind every cloud, there's a silver lining. You know, Job, tomorrow will be better. Hey, Job, tough times don't last, but tough times people do, you know, all those little sayings that people use to sort of cheer people up and give them a it it would all be so vain, so hollow, so stupid for Job at that moment. He he was being real. There may come in your life calamity in which it is entirely appropriate for you to mourn. And, and, And sometimes Christians feel guilty over this. You shouldn't feel guilty. There is a mourning that is appropriate for a believer. Now, I will also say that there is a type of mourning that is inappropriate for the believer. You know, at this time in the ancient world, they practiced certain customs of mourning among the pagan peoples, certain tattoos that they would make for the dead and these other sort of rituals. Job did not follow the pagan customs of mourning. I like how Paul puts it in one of his letters. He says, we mourn, but not as those who have no hope. 
that there's a such thing as a hopeful mourning, a mourning that is real, that is sorrowful, that recognizes the reality of the loss, but at the same time trusts God and has hope in the Lord. Uh, uh, that was Job's mourning. So notice this. First, he mourned. But then what was the second thing he did? He worshipped. Could you imagine how absolutely dumbfounded the devil, was, the devil was when he heard Job worship the Lord? He said, I couldn't believe it. He's supposed to be cursing God. And now he's worshipping the Lord. And it just makes you think that at that moment, Job was probably offering forth the purest worship he had ever had in his life. You know, you think about it, and uh, you may be blessed as I am to, to, to be part of a, of a church, you know, community where, where there's tremendous worship where there's a great atmosphere of worship, there's a great worship ministry, the, the, the people who lead worship are both gifted and talented and anointed. And you know, in that kind of atmosphere, a lot of times, man, I mean, worship is just electric. It's easy to worship God. You know, you get in there and man, it's just, it, it, there's just something about uh, hundreds of people getting together who want to worship God and, and anointed and gifted leadership who's up there who wants to lead them in worship. And man, they barely have to hit a chord and everybody's worshiping God. It's easy. To, it's, isn't that great to worship the Lord in such circumstances? And, and there's, that's wonderful. I say nothing against that at all. But you know, there's other times when worship is very difficult, isn't it? Perhaps you're under a tremendous amount of strain or stress. Or perhaps you're not feeling well. Uh, perhaps you're, you're in the midst of a community where the, the, the worship isn't so great. Or, or maybe that person up there, you know, leading the, the worship just isn't all that talented or gifted. And, and you just say, man, who could worship to this? Well, can I just say, if Job could worship on this afternoon, I don't know what excuse we have for not worshiping. You know, and isn't it true that this is, one might say, often the purest worship that we offer to God? What, what the psalmist called a, and the writer to the, to the Hebrews, called the sacrifice of praise. That's great to worship God when it's easy. Hallelujah for that. But you know, when it's time where you say, Lord, there's not a single cell in my body that feels like worshiping you right now, but I'm going to worship you nonetheless. That is a sacrifice of praise. And that's very well-pleasing unto the Lord. So Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. Now look, I, I need to say this, but before we move on to verse 21, I just need to remind you something. Don't forget this moment as we continue on in our study of the book of Job. Because later on in the book of Job, Job is not going to seem very worshipful. Later on in the book of Job, you're going to say, Job, are, are you, is this the same guy who worshipped at that moment? Well, there's a lot of struggle in front of Job. His trial is not over yet. It just didn't end in that one day, nor in the second day that we're going to take a look at in chapter 2. But what I want you to understand is this. Don't forget that Job's first reaction was to worship. Isn't that often very revealing, what our first reaction is to something, right? Oftentimes, that's very revealing to the true character. I won't say always. I wouldn't say that's 100% true. But listen, it's often true, isn't it? That the first reaction that you have really displays where your character is at and where your instincts are at. I want you to know, Job's first reaction was worship. And no matter how much he struggles, no matter how much sometimes, and listen, sometimes later in the book, he's going to be shaking his fist up to heaven. No matter how much he does that, don't you ever forget that his first reaction was to worship. And that says a lot about this man. And then he said something. Look at what he said, verse 21 and 22. This, this is profound. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See what he said there? The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. 
Job was a brilliant man. He analyzed his situation in both a godly and a wise way. Job understood. You know what he understood? First of all, he understood that he came into this world with nothing. So that everything he had was indeed a blessing from the bounty of God. Now, it's true that this evening, because let's say the afternoon of crisis and calamity is over, right? When Job woke up in the morning, he was a rich man with 10 beautiful adult children. Now, in the evening, he's a very poor man, and all of his children are dead. He has much less in the evening than he had in the morning. But you know what he does? He looks around and he says, you know what? It's still more than I came into the world with. So Job had all of this and he lost it in one afternoon. And then there he is sitting, you know, dressed in his robe or whatever he was wearing, right? He's sitting there thinking about his situation. He goes, I've lost everything. It's all gone. It's all gone. Then he looks down at his robe and he picks at his robe and he goes, you know what? I didn't have this robe when I came into the world. And now I have a robe. Hey, I'm running in the plus column, right? I'm ahead of the game. I've got more than I started out with. And wouldn't you say that's true with every one of us? And not only that, not only do I have more than I started out with, I've got more than I can take with me into the world beyond. I'm doing pretty good. You and I say, but Job, you lost everything. You, 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 you only have the clothes on your back. He goes, well, at least I have those. It's more than I came into this world with, and it's more than I'm going to leave this world with. But man, Job, that's a godly analysis. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Naked I came into the world, and naked shall I return there. And then he said, the Lord gave. Understand that. Job understood that his prior prosperity was not due to luck, right? Oh boy, I have been really lucky until now. No, he said, the Lord gave me what I had before. Nor did he say this. Now, might I say that this might've been my reaction or the reaction of many of us would say, listen, all my hard earned labor is now down the tubes. I've lost everything I've worked for. He didn't say that. He said, no, the Lord gave it to me. Job understood that his prosperity was not due to luck or to mere human ingenuity. It was because of the great and powerful blessing of God upon his life. He said, listen, I see the hand of God everywhere giving to me. He didn't say I earned it. He said, no, 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 God gave it to me. And therefore Job realized that God was in control of his life. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. By the way, Job did not say Satan has taken away. Now, this is a very interesting thing, isn't it? Would he have been theologically correct to say that Satan has taken away? Yes, it would have been true. Was he theologically incorrect in saying that God took it away? Well, you can answer that yourself just by looking at the last verse of the chapter right there. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. (laughs) That pretty much answers it, right? So Job would not have been wrong to have attributed this to Satan, but also it was not wrong to say that the Lord did it. You know why? Because Job understood that whatever Satan could do, he could only do it at the permission of God. He understood that his life was not at the mercy of unseen spiritual forces that he had nothing to do with and could not have any recourse to God. No, God was in control of his life. You see, no matter what the source of adversity or tragedy was, it had to pass through the loving and the wise hands of God before it could touch him. Job very well could have said, the Lord gave and the Chaldeans took away and the Sabaeans took away and a fire that fell from the sky took away and a great wind that blew across the plains and blowed down my oldest son's house took away. He could have said all those things, right? But he understood that the Lord was ultimately in control of all of those things. And nothing could touch Job unless it had passed through the hands of this loving and wise God. You see, Job understood that God was worthy to be blessed and praised in any and in all the circumstances of life. 
He only saw the hand of God in these events. Every secondary cause vanished away. He doesn't blame the Chaldeans. He doesn't blame the Sabaeans. He doesn't blame the sky. He doesn't blame the wind. He knows that the Lord is in control of it all. What a wise and godly man. I think we need to get back to the simple philosophy of Job. You can just meditate on the implications of that one phrase that Job said, where he said, the Lord gave. Isn't that true in your life? Think of whatever possessions, whatever material things you have in this world, whether you consider them to be great or small. And I would say, you could say that the Lord gave. And this gives us many different implications on this. First of all, it means that we should never think that the good things of this world come to us from the earth. No, the good things of this world come to us from heaven. You say, well, listen, you know, sure, I have a nice, you know, computer or MP3 player or something like that. That's no big deal. You know, all of my friends have the same. As a matter of fact, they have nicer than I have. So, you know, it's really not any big deal. Well, listen, I would still say that the Lord gave, right? Because you could say that at least the Lord gave that you should be born into this time, into this culture, where such things are cheap and relatively easily available. You could have very easily been born in another place, in another time, in another part of the earth, where such things are only a dream for the most extremely wealthy. And by the way, notice this. He said that the Lord gave. It reminds us that every material thing we have comes to us as a gift. It's undeserved. And you can consider this, that when God gives gifts, God gives his gifts with kindness and thoughtfulness. Some of you perhaps are good gift givers. I'm not an especially good gift giver. My wife is a good gift giver. You know, when she thinks about what to get for this person for their birthday or for Christmas or when we're away on a trip, she's always saying, well, look, shouldn't we get gifts for the people when we come back home or, you know, this or that? I'm never thinking of these things. And and and, and when it does come to me thinking about, okay, we need to buy a gift, I say, well, that's easy. We'll just buy some gifts. Let's buy one of these and one of these and one of these. And that'll never do for my wife. Because my wife puts a lot of thoughtfulness and kindness into each gift, right? She's thinking, well, what's suited for this person? What will be really special for them? What will be good for them? What will be a real blessing for them? Now listen, if that's true of some human beings on this earth, how much more true is it of God? When God gives, he gives with great thoughtfulness and kindness. And then knowing that God gives us these things sweetens the value of everything that we have. You know, maybe the Bible that you hold on your lap right now, maybe that's a sweet thing to you. Maybe you have some sentimental value to that. I I like this Bible, you might say. It's really a nice Bible. And you say, you know, what really makes this Bible precious to me is that it was given to me by, you know, and you could fill in the blank, by your saintly grandfather or by your mother or by somebody in your life. Say, well, this, this Bible is even more precious to me because of who gave it to me. Well, shouldn't that make everything in your life more precious to you when you consider who gave it to you? The Lord gave. The Lord gave you all these things. By the way, when we understand that the Lord gave, it also keeps us from dishonesty. Because when we steal something, then we can say we have it, but the Lord didn't give it to us. No, we stole it. Maybe there's things that you have materially right now that you cannot honestly say the Lord gave that to you because you stole it. Well, then you should give it back. You you don't want to mix what God gives to you with what the devil gives to you. And by the way, it also shows us that it's very foolish for us to take any pride in having more than what another person has. You see, it's just simply what God gives unto us. And isn't it very easy to give back to God of our material things when we realize that everything we have comes from him? That's very easy. You know, if somebody were to give you a a hundred euros and then the next day come over to you and they just gave it to you as a wonderful gift and the next day they came and say, well, you know, could I have 10 euros back? You know, I just, I I need something. You would be very uh, cheap. You'd be not a good person. To say, no, you gave me a hundred euros yesterday, but I'll give you nothing back. Isn't that just what God does to us? And by the way, we always remind ourselves when we think of these things that we must worship the giver 
and not the gifts. The giver is always greater than the gifts that he gives. Well, so at this critical moment, Job, with tremendous wisdom, with tremendous grace in his life, he said there in verse 21, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. And then that great line, right? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, when it says in verse 20 that Job worshipped the Lord, this is how he worshipped the Lord. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. He was able to bless the name of God. And even he was able to bless the name of God when he was specifically and severely tempted to curse the name of God. That was the whole business of the temptation. Satan deliberately set out to tempt Job to curse the name of God. And instead of cursing the name of God, he blesses the name of God. Listen, I don't know. I I don't think we, we don't have any indication that Job was aware of this satanic strategy, but you almost wish he was. You almost wish it was that calculated because when it is that calculated, it's a wonderful thing. When you realize what the devil is tempting you towards, You'll say, well, then I am determined to do the exact opposite. Charles Spurgeon, as you might imagine, had a great story along those lines. I'll read the story to you, and you'll just sort of get it as I bring it along. He says, remember the story of the man who was going to give a pound to some charitable institution. The devil said, no, you cannot afford it. Then said the man, back to the devil, I'm going to give two pounds. I'm not going to let you talk to me this way. Well, then Satan exclaimed, you're a fanatic. And then the man replied, well, then I'm going to give four pounds. Ah, Satan said, what will your wife say when you go home and tell her that you've given away four pounds? Well, said the man, I'll give eight pounds now. And if you don't mind what you're at, devil, you're going to tempt me to give 16 pounds. So the devil was obliged to stop because the more he tempted him, the more he went the other way. And then Spurgeon applies it. So let it be so with us. If the devil would tempt us to curse God, let us bless him all the more. And if Satan will be wise enough to leave off tempting us when he finds that, the more he attempts to drive us, the more we go in the opposite direction. Isn't that a great mentality to say? All right, let me sense whatever it is that the devil's tempting me to do, and I'm going to do directly the opposite. I think you'll find a lot less temptation in your life that way, right? If the devil were to soon find that every temptation he would offer to you would be terribly counterproductive to his cause. That's exactly what happened in the course of Job's life. Then in verse 22, we have this divine commentary on what Job did. It's really remarkable to read. It tells us here, In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Now listen, this demonstrates, as I mentioned before, that Job did not sin. He did not wrongly blame God when he said the Lord has taken away. He was right to understand that God was ultimately behind all things, even if the immediate responsibility for the event was not God's responsibility. You see, we're impressed with Job's perspective on material things. Job seemed to understand perfectly what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, where Jesus said, one's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. There are very few people in the world today who can endure the loss of this kind of fortune with the kind of godliness and patient endurance that Job showed. But we're also impressed with Job's unshaken commitment to God, his enduring love for the Lord. You see, Satan's accusation, God, if you take away the blessings from Job's life, then he'll openly curse you. That accusation was proved to be a lie. And we might say that God was justifiably proud of his servant Job. You see, in this first round of spiritual warfare, Satan was absolutely unsuccessful in shaking Job from his standing in faith. Job successfully battled in spiritual attack, and he fulfilled the exhortation that the Apostle Paul would bring many, many hundreds of years after the time of Job, where Paul said this, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Don't you think Job is a perfect example of that? 
Isn't it true that the next time I preach on Ephesians chapter 6, that old spiritual warfare, you know I can't wait to use Job as an example. Because isn't he a remarkable example of someone who was spiritually attacked in a tremendous way, and he did exactly what Paul says that we should do. He stood. He was unshakable. You've probably seen that picture. It's sort of a familiar poster where you have this lighthouse that's almost being overwhelmed by great waves, right? But it's steadfast in the midst of it. It's still standing solid, no matter how great the waves are that assaulted. That's exactly where Job was. A flood of spiritual attack and oppression had come upon him, yet he stood steadfast. You see, Job stood. He stood against fear, and he didn't give in to panic. Do do you see Job running around? Oh my, what am I going to do? I've lost everything. You know, call the accountant, do this or that. No, 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 he didn't give in to panic. Job made a stand against make-believe pretending, and he appropriately mourned. Job made a stand against pride, and he humbled himself before God. Job made a stand against self, and he decided to worship God. Job made his stand against a time-bound mindset, and he chose instead to think in terms of eternity. Job made his stand against unbelief, and he didn't give himself in to questionings against God. That'll happen later, but right now he's standing. Job made his stand against despair, and he saw the hand of God even in catastrophe, and Job made a stand against anger, and he didn't blame God. This is what I want you to see. Before we jump into the first few verses of chapter 2, I just want to remind you something. This wonderful triumph of faith in the life of Job. Is there anybody here tonight who can tell me that this wonderful triumph of faith in the life of Job, that it came from Job acting all alone? You don't believe that for a moment, do you? You see such a hero of faith at a moment like this, and this is what you know, right? you know that the Spirit of God was sustaining him. You know that the hand of God, invisible as it was, was holding him up. Now, let's freely admit, the text does not tell us so, right? The text doesn't tell us so, but you know it must be true, right? You, you, you know, it's said that wherever you find a, a, a great man, there's a, there's a great woman standing behind him, right? A successful man, there's a great woman standing behind him. And this is true, I suppose, Listen, how much more true is wherever you find a a saint standing against the attacks of the enemy, you find a God sustaining that saint all the way, right? So listen, I want you to think of it for a moment here. It's as if the Lord challenged Satan like this. Okay, Satan, I'll let you attack Job in some unusual ways, but I'm going to support him in some unusual ways. I'm going to let you savage him greatly, but I will uphold him greatly. I'm going to let you bring a cascade of fear and and, and panic upon him, but I'm going to shower him with my spirit. It's as if a saying I heard in a great speech many years ago where a politician in a time of war, he called out to his enemy and he said, you do your worst and we will do our best. And that's as if what God said to Satan. Go ahead, Satan. Do your worst against Job. And God says under his breath, and I will do my best in him. I will do my work in him. You see, God strengthened Job. There was great comfort from God. And in all of this, Satan was utterly, utterly disappointed. Which brings us, of course, here to chapter 2, verse 1. And let's make as much as our way through chapter 2 as we can in the next 20 minutes. Verse 1, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to prevent, present himself before the Lord. Now, I got to say, we cannot read that first verse without some sense of sadness, right? Don't you wish that could have all been over after chapter 1? Don't you wish that there could have just been a verse 23 to chapter 1, right? And they all lived happily ever after. Amen. And we'd be, reg- we'd be studying the book of Job, one chapter long, right? We'd say, oh, isn't it wonderful how this man of faith withstood all this great attack? But it doesn't end that way, does it? It's a little depressing, I've got to be honest with you. And let's face it, one of the difficult things in this walk with the Lord that we have is that you've got to endure, right? Eugene Peterson, an author of some Christian books, some of them have been very good. 
He wrote a book many years ago, and yeah, the book's okay, but I think that the very best thing about the book is a title of the book. I've probably quoted it to you once before. This is the title of the book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. That's what God requires of us, a long obedience in the same direction. We kind of wish that our Christian life could be lived at a, at a couple very heroic points. Woo, I made that stand and I did it. You know what? And God says, well, tomorrow you got to do the same thing too. There's going to come another thing. It's got to be a long obedience in the same direction. So again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil? And still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. A couple things we notice. First of all, we know that this dialogue recorded here was completely unknown to Job, right? This is behind the curtain. Job can't see it. He, he doesn't know. And might I just remind you, there are things going on behind that curtain relevant to your life that you can't see. And maybe if you could see behind the curtain, and I'm not saying that you could or that you should, God has a reason for leaving that curtain there. But there are things happening behind that curtain that would make things in your life make sense as well. So just accept it. There's things happening behind that curtain that make sense out of the things in your life. Job couldn't see it. Now, I, I have a theory. Okay, It's just a theory. I don't expect you to believe it because I can't prove it. But I'm just going to throw it out there. I believe that Job wrote the book of Job and that many years after the resolution of it all, God showed him or told him what happened behind the curtain. And then Job could say, oh, well, that explains it. Now I understand. But that's just a theory of mine. Maybe it wasn't true of Job. Maybe Job never knew until he got to heaven, until he actually went behind that curtain. Did God show him that? I can't say it for sure. But that's just a theory of mine. So anyway, Satan was doing his thing back and forth across the earth. And God sort of brags to Satan again. Have you seen my servant Job? He's holding fast to his integrity. Now, you notice here, although you have incited me against him, you see, this is very interesting again. This shows that both God and Satan understood that the attack could only come to Job because God allowed it. Satan could not do this on his own. It was only because God allowed it. And again, I think it's very interesting what it says there in verse 3, where God says, although and you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. Now, it's very important to understand what we mean there. It isn't that God was saying for no reason. God had a great reason in allowing Satan to do what he did. There was a tremendous reason behind it. Please understand that. But when it says without cause, he means without cause in Job. In other words, there was no great sin in Job's life that God was punishing or correcting by all of this. It's not like Job deserved any of this. Job didn't deserve it. His deserving or non-deserving of it was not the issue. God had a purpose, but there was not a cause in Job that provoked all of this. So, you can just imagine Satan's feeling here, right? He's, he's angry, right? He's very bitter against God. He lost the bet. Job was faithful. Satan was proven to be untrue again. God was proven to be true again. And so what does Satan say in his bitter reply, verse 4? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he'll give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he's in your hand, but spare his life. Wow. Satan answers back. Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. You saw that there in verse 4, right? 
Satan here asserted that Job did not curse God only because he was afraid that if he did, it would bring a personal punishment upon him. See, I gotta have you understand this. Do you understand what Satan was arguing here? It's as if Satan was saying this to the Lord. Now listen, God, the, the problem with Job is that he's even worse as a man than I ever imagined. Because he is such a selfish man that all he cares about is his own skin. You take away all of his money. You take away all of his servants. You even take away his kids. He doesn't care as long as you don't touch him personally. As long as Job wakes up in the morning and, you know, he's feeling okay. Oh, yeah, everything's all right. Ooh, yeah, it's okay. That's all he cares about. Oh, but if you let me touch him. If you let me attack his physical body, I will have him cursing you in short order. You see, Job, excuse me, Satan tried to argue that Job was even worse than he had thought before. You know, it's kind of interesting. When it came right down to it, Abraham, the great patriarch, Abraham, man of faith, right? We're all pro-Abraham, right? Abraham, that great man of faith, he betrayed his wife in order to save his skin, didn't he? Think of David, right? We're all pro-David, right? David forsook his sanity in order to save his life. Think about Peter. We're all pro-Peter here in this room, right? Like Peter? Yes, yay, Peter. Peter denied Jesus to save his own life. Listen, Satan said this for a reason. When he said, all that a man has, he will give for his life, there's some truth to that, isn't there? He had reason to believe that this might just work with Job. And that's why he said there, touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to his face. Satan insisted that if the attack were made against Job directly, if some calamity came upon Job's body, then Job would certainly curse God. So here he is uh, suggesting a new test for Job, and the new test is physical suffering. It wasn't enough to take away all his possessions. It wasn't enough to take away all of his family. It wasn't enough to attack him all of that port down in one day on Monday. There's a great waterfall. No, here's a new test. Make him suffer physically. Listen, isn't it true that, th that there is a whole nother dimension in physical suffering? Now, look, as I stand here this evening and, and speak to you on this matter, I have to make a confession to you. I, I speak on this, I have to say thankfully, from a very theoretical standpoint. I, I have not had to endure much physical pain in my life. I, I, I from time to time, hear from people or pray with people or, or minister to people who have undergone great physical pain in their life of one kind or another. I mean, I've had a little bit of things here and there, but compared to most people in life, I've suffered very little physical pain. So what I'm going to share to you is really just in the theoretical basis. But let me just say this. Isn't it very true that more than one person has withstood tragedy in one area of their life, but when physical pain to them, they crumbled? Physical pain came when they just couldn't stand against it any longer. He has reason to believe this would work. And so he says, no, let me at his flesh. What did God say? God said, no, I'll never let you touch my servant Job. He passed one test. He'll never have to undergo another. Now, that wasn't what the Lord said, was it? That's what I wish he would have said for both Job and for me. No, he said, no. Behold, he's in your hand, but spare his life. Now, we notice two things again, just like we did with the first test as recorded in chapter one, that God gave Satan permission, but he didn't give him a free hand to do whatever he wanted to, right? God will never just turn us over to Satan to do whatever Satan wants to do to us. And we're very thankful for this, aren't we? Because if Satan could do to you what he wants to do to you, he would just destroy you. Do you remember that very frightening statement that Jesus made to Peter, very short to the time of Jesus' crucifixion, when Peter was filled with self-confidence about who he was and his ability to stand before the Lord? Do you remember what, what Jesus said to Peter? 
He said, Peter, Satan has asked for you that he might sift you like wheat. I don't know if Peter comprehended it when Jesus said it. If he did comprehend it, I bet the biggest cold chill went up the spine of Peter that he ever experienced in his life. Because to think seriously for a moment about what Satan wants to do to you, if he only could, well, that's a frightening thing to think about. But you remember what Jesus said to Peter? He said, but I've prayed for you. In other words, I've put a stop. Yeah, Satan's going to be able to do some things to you, uh, Peter, but not everything he wants to. And that was the same case here with Job. Behold, he's in your hand, but spare his life. Satan was given a greater allowance to attack Job, but not an unlimited allowance. So what happened? Verse 7. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a pot sherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Job was struck with painful boils. This disease that came upon Job was specifically meant by Satan to drive Job to such great despair that he would curse God, right? That was Satan's whole goal. It wasn't, well, I'm going to make Job, you know, farsighted so he can't read anymore. Ha, 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 you know, something that would be, yes, not good, but just an inconvenience in life. Satan said, no, I'm going to bring something upon Job that will make him so miserable that he'll curse God. And what came upon Job? All over his body erupted upon his skin all these painful boils. The attack against Job was severe. They're called painful boils. And it was massive from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Now, you know all the organs of your body, right? Your heart, your liver, your kidneys. Your body is filled with many marvelous organs. But there's one organ of your body that's bigger than any other organ, and that's your skin. And Satan attacked the skin of Job to where everywhere all over his body. He looked grotesque. He felt grotesque, and all he could do was scrape himself with a broken piece of pottery and sit upon an ash heap. Now again, we're challenged by this to see that Satan has power to attack mankind in ways that perhaps we previously did not perceive. It is true that sometimes Satan can attack a person physically previously saw that Satan could inspire other people to attack Job. That happened in chapter 1. And that Satan could direct natural calamity as an attack against Job. That also happened in chapter 1. But here we see that disease and physical suffering could come against Job as an attack from Satan. Another example of this scripturally is in Luke chapter 13, where Jesus revealed that a woman who had been afflicted for 18 years was actually afflicted with what Jesus called a spirit of infirmity, and that she was bound by Satan in that condition. Now, are we trying to say that everybody has some physical affliction? It has come to them from the hand of Satan? No. Listen, certainly, certainly there's some people like that, right? I think sometimes we're so quick to look for a medical explanation that sometimes we we don't even conceive that there could be a spiritual explanation. Listen, the last thing I want to do is look to any sick person and say, well, I know for certain that your sickness is caused by Satan. But but surely it has happened in the past and it can happen again. And we just need to be aware to this potentiality, to this uh, possibility. Now, the exact nature of Job's ailment has been debated. Some people suggest one disease. Other people suggest another disease. We we really don't know. But I can say that if you look through the book of Job very carefully, you can discern what I would call Job's medical chart. You know, I have that right here with me, right here today. I have Job's medical chart. You just look through the book of Job and look at carefully his complaints. And if anybody's interested afterwards, I could give you chapter and verse where he mentions each one of these things or each one of these things is described to Job. But let me describe to you Job's physical condition as he describes it in the book of Job. What did he suffer from? Well, first of all, intense pain. Secondly, 
from peeling and darkened skin. Third, he had pus-filled, erupting sores all over his body. Next, he suffered from anorexia and emaciation. He just couldn't eat, and he was wasting away with his body. He suffered from fever. He suffered from depression. He suffered from uncontrollable weeping. He suffered from sleeplessness, yet when he did fall asleep, he would have terrible nightmares. He had difficulty breathing. He had failing vision. He had rotting teeth. He had haggard looks. He had painful, swollen sores all over his body. He had intense itching, and he had bad breath, the Bible even tells us. And this condition lasted for months in Job. That's tough. So can you see this man, this godly man, this blameless man, sitting on an ash heap, and he takes a broken piece of pottery and he scrapes his sores. Why? I, I don't think it was for a medical thing, although some people try to say it. I think they just itched so uncontrollably badly that he found himself doing this. He dealt with his painful affliction to the best of his ability, and then he sat in a mournful place. It tells us that he sat in the midst of the ashes. You know what that probably means? In the city dump where garbage was burned. Job was probably sitting on a burned heap, taking a broken piece of pottery, scraping himself the best that he could. And there's one commentator, he says that even though this burned out place of ashes was somewhat messy, it might have been the most sterile place where a man with sores could sit. Now, that might only be coincidental, but it may very well be. But the ancients, by their own practices, have found that it was physically advantageous for a man who had Job's kind of condition to sit in a place that was relatively sterile, because bacteria and all that stuff, it can't live in the midst of that kind of fire. And so maybe that was the best, maybe that's why he was sitting there at the garbage dump in the midst of burning heaps, scraping himself with a broken piece of pottery. Well, if you thought it couldn't get worse, look at verse 9. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, this, of course, is the appearance on the scene, the brief appearance of Job's wife. And Job's wife has become a proverbial example of a cruel unsupportive, sharp-tongued wife. And I think sometimes unjustifiably so. Some allowance must be made for the fact, considering her losses in the previous days, right? D didn't she lose everything? Didn't she lose all 10 of her children? She should not be too harshly judged. C could you blame Job's wife for being a little bit mad at this moment? When I say mad, I mean crazy mad, right? Because let's face it, she's had devastating losses. She should not be judged too harshly. She, she just perhaps couldn't bear to see her su husband suffer like this. Her, her heart was crushed by the loss of her 10 children. And now she's without hope. Look, Job, just curse God. Then God will strike you dead. It's as if God's God striking you dead, but slowly. Just get it finished off. Escape this pain. Job, death would be better than this. And listen, hasn't many a family found themselves in the same situation today? Death would be better than this. Nevertheless, the implication of her words is very harsh and not very flattering towards her, where she says in verse 9, do you still hold fast to your integrity? The implication there is that she has given hers up. I've given up, Job. You should too. So what did Job say in response? He said, listen, you're speaking as one of the foolish women speaks. This was a very wisely worded rebuke to Job's wife. He didn't accuse her of being a foolish woman, but he said, you're speaking like a foolish woman speaks. Now, honey, I'm not saying you're foolish, 
But you know those foolish women? You're talking just like them. He indicated that this was out of character for her. And by the way, shouldn't we see in here just sort of a satanic strategy as well? Right? Couldn't we say that Satan, at least at this moment, was working through Job's wife, who otherwise we would expect to be a godly and supportive woman, but maybe at this moment of weakness, beset by grief because of all the losses she had endured, and they were tremendous losses, maybe somehow a door had been opened for her, for her as well, to be used by Satan to get at Job again. Yet Job says to her, Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? Now again, there's great wisdom in Job's reply. He says, listen, Job knows, uh, God knows what he's talking about. God knows what he's doing. We're wise to see that even in adversity, there might be a gift from God that we should accept. And God puts his own stamp of approval on there in verse 10, where he says, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, I want you to notice something here. In all this is a very broad statement, meaning that up to this point, Job had not sinned by what he had said. This is important for us to notice because there are some people who say that all these calamities came upon Job because of what they would say a negative confession that he made. Job thought that something bad might ba happen to him, and so something bad did happen to him. And this is what they attribute this to. Now, supposedly, the negative confession was recorded in Job 1.5 and later in Job chapter 3. But this statement makes it very clear that Job did not sin with his lips, certainly not in the sense of a negative confession. Now, at the end of this all, we have the consolating words of Job's friends. Let's conclude with the last few words of this chapter beginning here at verse 11. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place. Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, for they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they had raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept, and each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. I want you to leave Job chapter 2 with that picture very vivid in your mind. I want you to picture Job on the ash heap, his three friends weeping with him, not saying a thing, Tears streaming down their face, just in utter sympathy, in utter identification, in strong friendship with this man, Job. And we leave Job, we leave his friends seated in silence. But let me tell you what it is. It's the calm before the storm. You see, because after this point in the book of Job, th there begins... 35 chapters of discussion between Job and his friends. But it's very important for us to put that discussion in the right context, that they sit down with him and they mourn with him. We'll pick it up with this discussion about Job and his friends next time that we come together. But there they are, the calm before the storm, Job sitting together with these friends of his. And I have to say, it's remarkable to think that these men had such love and such compassion for Job that they would come and sit and do this. But we'll pick up on the same theme next time we're together and we cover Job chapter 3. Father, I pray that you would give unto us that same kind of steadfast spirit that Job had. We think of how he stood in the evil day against all kind of attack, against all the wiles of the devil. And Lord, it makes us say that we want to be able to stand in the same way. Won't you help us, Lord? Won't you fill us with your spirit? Won't you uphold us by your unseen hand, no matter what the difficulties we have, 
And no matter, Lord, what is going on behind your curtain that separates heaven and earth that we cannot see or understand, Lord, at the same time, we just say, sustain us, Lord Jesus. Help us to stand in the evil day. And thank you for the many times in the past that you have done that. It gives us great hope for what you will do in the future. We pray this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen.